Greetings and welcome. We are in Senior English A. And we now will turn to the poets of the Renaissance. Now that term Renaissance, as you learned from your reading out of your hymnal, that's that introductory reading on the Renaissance, is a time of dynamic change, growth, the word itself means rebirth or rediscovering. A time where England and other parts of Europe are rediscovering Greek and Roman thought. Okay? They are rediscovering Greek and Roman thought. One of the ways that we talk about Renaissance poetry changing is in the creation of sonnets. Now here you definitely want to be taking notes. Let's imagine for a moment, and it's a fair imagining, that you had to write a song. What does that mean? Three things. These are the rules of a sonnet. Basically, you only got to worry about three things for the sonnet that you'll be working with for us. Number one, all sonnets have a certain prescribed number of lines. Fourteen and only 14, not 15, not 13. The best way for me to explain this part of it is you're shooting hoops at the park when about three blocks away you hear someone's stereo coming and you immediately know that they're listening to rap music. You don't know anything else about it, but you can tell that the music and the stereo coming out of the car or the truck is rap music. How do you know that? because rap has a certain kind of rhythmic beat to it that allows for you to immediately identify that genre of music. Now, hello, I'm not asking whether you like rap music or not. And people who don't like it say it all sounds the same, which is, of course, ludicrous. It's true, though. Did you get the pun? It's ludicrous. Uh, but, right, thank you, thank you. Uh, but the reality is we're not interested in your perception of what you think of a certain kind of music. Even if you don't like rap music, you will accept what I'm about to say. It has a certain kind of rhythm to it that allows for it to be that kind of music. Would you agree with me? The way I like to think of sonnet writing is very similar. <coughs> think of it like a shoebox. Everybody gets the same size shoebox. The creative act is who can put the most stuff inside of the shoebox. In sonnet writing, the shoebox, the rules, one, 14 lines, can't go more, can't go less, got to have 14. Two, number two, you have to have at the end of the, of the lines a certain kind of understanding of rhyme scheme. Words sounding similar and a certain kind of rhyme scheme. Now, ultimately, the kind of poem that I would want you to write, sonnet that I would want you to write, is what we will call a Shakespearean sonnet. You want to write that down? A Shakespearean sonnet. And an easy example of a, a Shakespearean sonnet is right there on page 276. Page 276. So skip over to page 276 real quickly. And here you have a classic example of a Shakespearean sonnet. Now we often will refer to this as well as an Elizabethan sonnet. Now we'll talk about Sydney sonnets and Spencer or Spencerian sonnets or Petrarchian sonnets or Shakespearean sonnets. What do all these have in common? They're named after the person who wrote. Who's the most famous sonneteer? What does that mean? A guy who writes sonnets. Who's the most famous sonneteer of the Renaissance? Shakespeare. Which is why even today if you ask who's the greatest poet in the English language, always number one will be Shakespeare. Some of you will say, well, I knew he wrote plays like R&J, like Julius Caesar, like Macbeth and Hamlet, but he's also known for the poetry that he wrote. You're looking, if you're looking at page 276, you're looking at a famous Shakespearean sonnet called Sonnet 116, a sonnet that I will go over in more detail later. But what I want to point out is do you notice how there is a certain kind of rhyme scheme that we will qualify for your notes as A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. Well, now, wait a minute. What exactly does that mean? At the end of the first line of Sonnet 116, we would write a little A. 
we would notice that at the end of the third line, the word will rhyme with the end of the first line. Do you see it? Did you see at the end of the second line, it doesn't rhyme with the first line, so we're not going to write the letter A. We're going to write another letter B. But notice that at the end of the fourth line, it rhymes with the end of the second line. Do you see that? Which is why, watch my whiteboard, a Shakespearean sonnet has 14 lines. Got to have 14. And the rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B. That's our first four lines. Then C, D, C, D. That's our next four lines. Then E, F, E, F. That's our next four lines. Three times four is what? Twelve. Remember, you got to have 14 lines. Which means our last two lines, G, G, this is our last two rhymed couplet, which gets you your 14 lines. Do you got Okay. The third thing that makes a sonnet a sonnet for us in our talking, in our thinking, is what we will call iambic pentameter. Now you want to write that down at 2B, iambic pentameter. The reason that I'm pointing this out to you in advance is when we start to study these sonnets then, we're going to see how this works. Iambic pentameter. Now what does that actually mean, iambic pentameter? So when we're talking about a work of an Elizabethan poet, iambic pentameter, what does that even mean? Well, let's look at page 256. Page 256. First of all, all it means, iambic pentameter, all it means is rhythm. Rhythm. That's all it means. So that's the first thing you want to write down. Rhythm. Okay? For example, from another poem that maybe you're familiar with. Tell me not, in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead. That slumbers. And things are not what they seem. Life is dead. Real. Life is earnest. The grave is not its goal. Dust thou art to dust returnest was not spoken of the soul. Now I've been quoting a famous poem by an American poet named Longfellow, and the poem's title is Psalm of Life. That's one way for me to say that line, but listen carefully now to the next way I say it. I can say it a different way. I can say it this way. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art to dust, return as was not spoken of the soul. Bum, ba, 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 bum. You hear it? I'll stop now. That's what we mean by, that's what we mean by rhythm. That's what we mean by rhythm, okay? When you slow a line down to hear the rhythm, bum ba bum ba bum ba. When you slow the line down, we call that scanning. S C A N N I N G. Scanning the line. Write that down. You want that? You want that term in your notes? Scanning the line. Okay. Now, when we're looking at iambic pentameter, we're talking about a certain kind of rhythm. Let's begin on page 256. We'll be working with the sonnets of our first sonnet writer, Spencer, what we call sometimes a Spencerian sonnet, but he plays this game of iambic brilliantly, so we'll just use this as an example. I'm on page 256, 256, all right? So I'll be working with these sonnets of Spencer, but I'm going to start kind of in the back end here on sonnet 75. So you'll want to write it down to sonnet 75. I'm doing two things at one time. I'm going to introduce you to Sonnet 75 and Spencer, but at the same time, I'm also going to talk about iambic pentameter. Hello, it's a whole lot easier to hear it and to see it than for me to tell you about it, right? I mean, we could do worksheets on it all day long. It's a whole lot better for me to just explain it by showing it to you. Here we go. One day, are you reading with me? One day I wrote her name upon the strand, became the waves and washed it away. Again, I wrote it with a second hand. But came the tide, made my pains his prey. Vain man, said she, that dost in vain essay, a mortal thing so to immortalize, for I myself shall like to this decay, and eke my name be wiped out likewise. Not so, quote I. Let baser things devise the die in dust, but you shall live by fame, by verse, your virtues rare shall eternize, and in the heavens write your glorious name. 
where when as death shall all the world subdue, our love shall live and later life renew. Now, if you understood this poem, you would probably go, oh, because it's a really great love poem. We'll get to it. But all I'm interested in is just talking about how to hear the rhythm of this line. By the way, is this a sonnet? Does it have 14 lines? No. It does, doesn't it? Notice the numbers yeah. down the left-hand side. Do you see that? Right? We have 5, we have 10. Correct? So we got 14 lines. We could ask about the rhyme scheme. Uh-oh. Strand. Hand. Line 1, line 3. Away. Pray. Line 2, line 4. Got me? A, B, A, B. And you can study it more if you want. But what's this third thing? Iambic pentameter. It's the rhythm. Now look, there's two ways for me to read this poem. Take a look at it with me. One day, I wrote her name upon the strand, but came the ways and washed it away. Again, I wrote it with a second hand, but came the tide and made my pages pray. That's one way to read it. Now look at the lines while I read, but hear differently when I scan or slow down my reading. One day I wrote her name upon the strand. But came the waves and washed it away. You see that little inflection above the ED unwashed? Again I wrote it with a second hand. But came the tide and made my pains his prey. Ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum. Read the first line again with me. One day I wrote her name upon the strand. Do you see it? One day I wrote her name upon the strand. Ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum. Now watch my hand. Watch my hand as I do this. Ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum. That ba bum one day ba bum one day. That ba bum is what we call a foot of iambic. I m b i c. Iambic. Okay? I am. Ba bum. If you've got five of those in a line, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. One day I wrote her name up on the strand. That's a strand's a beach, by the way. Right? Ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. That's five. Pent means five. You want to write that down. So if I have five feet of iambic, we will call that iambic pentameter, meaning five. So ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum. Okay. Wait a minute. You remember those lines? Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil hands make civil hand, uh, civil blood unclean. What am I quoting? Yeah, this is the opening lines of what great play? What does he say about R and J? A pair of star-crossed lovers take their lives. Isn't that what he says? Remember? Wait a minute. A pair of star-crossed lovers take their lives is one way to say it. But if I scan it and slow it down, it sounds like this. A pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. A pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. Ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum. I could have told you this when you were a freshman, but you're too stupid to appreciate it. Now you're not. Shakespeare wrote the entire play of Romeo and Juliet in iambic pentameter. Ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum. The entire play he wrote in iambic pentameter. The only time he ever breaks iambic pentameter in that play is when there's about to be a fight. That is to say. Disharmony is about to happen. And then he'll break the iambic pentameter, and then he'll come right back to it again. Woo! The entire play written in this iambic pentameter. One day I wrote her name upon the strand. You're looking at it, right? Ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. Watch my, watch my whiteboard. Ba bum, one day, ba bum, I wrote, ba bum, her name, ba bum, upon, ba bum, the strand. You see it? Right? Ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. You see it? Ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. That's five. Do you get me? Yeah. 
Pentameter, five. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. By the way, to show you how easy it is to do this, because in English language, we speak most of the time in iambic. We speak most of the time in iambic. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Go ahead and try and jot down real quickly on your sheet of paper any line of iambic pentameter. Go ahead, give it a try real quickly. I wish that I was someplace else right now. See, I just made that up. I wish that I was someplace else right now. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Go ahead, go ahead, give it a try. Yeah, just try and do it on your own. Um, anything, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to have any meaning to it. Ready, go. Try to write it out. Ba -bum, ba -bum. I wish that I was someplace else right now. Go ahead, try and write it down. Some of you will feel like you're a crazy bag person on the streets of Denver because you're going to have to move your mouth to do it because you've got to hear the words. ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum this is the dumbest thing I've ever done. See, I just made it up again. This is the dumbest thing I've ever done. Go ahead. You can, you can cheat and write that one down if you like that one. Writing it down helps you to hear it. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Go ahead. Dude, you're going to have to do this for 14 lines because you're going to have to write one of these. Right? It's hard. See, that's a foot of my right there. It's hard. Ba -bum. It's hard, to, it's hard to write a sonnet right now. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. I'm almost right there, huh? Right? I want to point. It still sounds funny. See, I'm still at it. It still sounds funny. Now that I will try. That's how I have it. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Go ahead. Give it a try. I promise. I promise. Notice, even I say I promise, I promise, that's, that's iambic, that's a foot of iambic, I promise, see, in the English language, most of the time, most of the time, we speak in iambic, it's just you haven't heard it very often, because you don't slow down the cadences, got me? You don't slow down the cadences right now, got me? See, we speak this way. You ever, you ever uh, called on a phone and you get a computer? And you immediately know that ain't no human voice. The way you know it is the rhythm of the cadence of the speech, right? Iambic is the natural cadence of the English language. The Renaissance poets kind of figured this out and they started playing games with it. Got me? So you got to do a, an Elizabethan sonnet, which means what? Three things. One, you got to write 14 lines. Two, you're going to have to use that rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F. What's up with the final G? Look at sonnet 75. Notice subdue and renew rhyme. See it? Right? That's your final rhymed couplet. Couplet meaning two. Got me? The first four lines we call a qua train. Qua meaning four. Right? So you got three sets of four and then a final rhymed couplet GG. Now different sonneteers, writers of these things, will play different games with the rhyme scheme. They stick with 14 lines, they stick with the iambic pentameter, but they sometimes will play different games with the rhyme scheme. If you will look now on page five, on page 252, you're going to see one of those rhyme schemes, and you're going to need this for your notes. That's why I'm pointing it out to you. Do you see it says Petrarchian Sonnet on 252? Does everybody see that? 252. Do you see it? Petrarchian Sonnet. Do you see that it says the rhyme scheme is a little bit different? It's not like the one you're going to write. Notice it's an A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, right? Do you see it? Right? Then following that, C, D, C, D, or C, D, E, C, D, E. Do you see it? So there's going to be a little bit different rhyme scheme. We're talking about Spencer sonnets, okay? But be that as it may... The rhyme scheme of a Spencerian sonnet, A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, C, D, C, D, E, E. You see it? Right? Let's take a look at Spencer's sonnets here real quickly. Okay? <clears throat> We're going to first of all start with sonnet one. All right? So here I am now working with the sonnets of Spencer, Edmund Spencer. The first thing I want you to write down in your notes is that all three of these sonnets, we're only going to look at three from Spencer. Uh, sonnet 1, Sonnet 35, Sonnet 75. 75 is the one I was reading a second ago. All three of these come from a longer collection of works called Amoret, which means, of course, little love poems, Amoret. So let, the first thing I want to point out is that when these guys started writing these sonnets, most of them were sonnets about love. You should write that down. 
Most of them were sonnets about love, having something to do with love. Right. The second thing I should point out is that the sonnet sequence was addressed to Spencer's wife, Elizabeth Boyle, not to some kind of far away, unrecognizable person. All right? In Spencer's sonnet, his love inspires the speaker's poetry. Sonnet number one, let's work at them now. The speaker claims that he suffers because he cannot focus on anything but his girl. His brain can't focus on anything but his girl. Sonnet number one. In other words, a mnemonic that works rather well is, for Spencer sonnet number one, my girl is the number one thing in my mind. Take a look at it. Happy ye leaves, when as those lily hands which hold my life in their dead doing might, shall handle you and hold in love soft bands like captives trembling at the victor's sight, and happy lines on which with starry light those lamping eyes will deign sometimes to look and read the stars of my dying sprite, written with tears in heart's close bleeding book, and happy rhymes bathed in the sacred brook of Halcyon whence she derived is, when ye behold that angel's blessed look, my soul's long lacted food, my heaven's bliss, leaves, lines, and rhymes, seek her to please alone, whom, if ye please, I care for other none. I only care for my girl, and my whole life is given to writing about my girl. It makes sense that this would be the first in a sequence of sonnets, right? That is to say, nothing matters to me but my girl. Sonnet number 35. In Sonnet 35, he's going to make the argument that he suffers. He is in pain. This is not pain from getting hit in the head with a bat. This is pain from being in love with the girl. Take a look. My hungry eyes, though greedy, covert eyes, still to behold the object of their pain. With no contentment can themselves suffice, but having pine and having not, complain. In other words, when he doesn't get his girl, he complains all the time about it. Why won't she return my texts? What's up with that? That kind of thing. For lacking it, they cannot life sustain, and having it, they gaze on it the more. In their amazement, like Narcissus Bane, whose eyes him starve, so plenty makes me poor. Yet are mine eyes so filled with the store of that fair sight that nothing else they broke but loathe the things which they did like before and can no more endure on them to look. All this world's glory seemeth vain to me and all their shows but shadows saving she. Whoa, 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 you can put this easy in your own notes. What's he say about his girl? Looking at my girl makes looking at everything else in the world what? A waste of time. Ugly. You got it. In other words, the only thing I ever want to look at is her. But he in interestingly says it's like Narcissus, that person who looked into the lake and saw the reflection of herself and was so amazed by it, never could go away. Right? He says, all I want to do is think about her, look at her. I'm totally consumed by her. I can't get enough of her. It's like a fever in my mind. Sonnet 70, uh, Sonnet 35, Sonnet 75. Now, this is the one I read before already. Let's exegete real quickly. These are easy poems. Honestly, they're pretty easy poems to understand once you can kind of, uh, you know, get the key. Of all three of the, of the Spencerian sonnets that we have, this is probably the funnest one, so let's take a look at it. One day I wrote her name upon the strand. That is to say, he's walking with his girl along the strand, the beach, and he writes her name in the, in the sand. Look at the second line. But came the waves and washed it away. Washed away her, the name he had written, her name, right? Again I wrote it with a second hand. But came the tide and made my pains his prey. First four lines, what's he do? He writes his girl's name in the beach, in the sand. Wave comes, washes it away. He goes, ugh. So he does it again. Well, again the wave comes, washes it away. Line five. Vain man, that means silly, silly boy, his girl says to him. Vain man, said she, that doth in vain assay or try, 
a mortal thing, so to immortalize. For I myself shall like to this decay, and eke my name be wiped out likewise. What does she say? She says, you're kind of a silly boy. You don't understand. You can't write my name on the sand, and it lasts very long. Because the wave comes and wipes it away. In the same way she says that someday I also will be gone. And no one will ever know that I lived either. You're a silly boy to try to immortalize, make famous, my name or me. Look at the next line. Not so, quote, odd. Spencer says, I told her, way wrong answer. I can make you famous. Look at this. Not so, quote, odd. Let baser things devise to die in trust, but you shall live by fame. My verse, your virtues rare, shall eternize. Eternalize means to make live forever. In other words, what's he say to his girl? I'm going to make you famous. I'm going to make you so that you will be remembered forever. And in the heavens write your glorious name. Look at the last two lines and it all makes sense. Where Up to this point, you can imagine what the girl's probably doing to him. What's she probably doing to him? Rolling her eyes like, oh, brother. Right? A guy will say anything to get the girl. Seriously. Roll the eyes. Go, come on. You can't make me famous. I'm going to die just like everything else. Just like my name in the sand. The wave wiped it away. And he goes, no, no, no. I'm going to make you famous. Look at the last two lines. Where, when as death shall all the world subdue, our love shall live and later life Renew. And she goes, whoa, wait, wait, wait. What did you just say to me? Go back and look at it one more time. He says, not so. You're not going to die and be forgotten. Quote I. My verse, your virtues, rare, shall eternize. And in the heavens write your glorious name. In other words, he says to her, uh-uh, uh-uh. I'm going to write a poem about you. And every time somebody reads that poem... It's like you're alive all over again. And she goes, oh, brother, a guy will say anything to get the girl. But wait a minute, what did we just do? We read the poem. And in the process of reading the poem, what Spencer do from wherever he is? Told you so. Right? This becomes one of the famous poems of Spencer. And guess what? He was right after all. Does this mean that you girls should always believe everything a guy says? No. <laughs> Why is it the girls always answer? Seriously? All right, so there you go. An introduction to the sonnets of Spencer, okay?